Thank you once again for joining with us uh, as we do celebrate uh, this wonderful Resurrection Sunday. We're going to, um, we're going to read again uh, that passage from Luke 24. And so I would love you to turn there if that's okay. And then uh, we'll read verses 1 to 12 again. Uh, just to remind ourselves, let's never tire of this wonderful story. So Luke 24, 1 to, to 12. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinners be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to the others. To all the others, sorry. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. It's a remarkable account, isn't it? I mean, if you can, just imagine being around for that first Easter morning. This early Sunday morning, the day after the Jewish Sabbath, and the the women go to the tomb expecting to care for the, the, the dead body of their friend, the Lord Jesus. But as they approach, they see the stone rolled away. That, that stone that was placed there and sealed around it, as we're told in Matthew's gospel, because Jesus had these claims of, be, of coming back to life from the dead. And so the authorities sealed the stone to make sure that nobody could go in to tamper with the body. But no, the stone is rolled away. The women go in and find the tomb empty. This is remarkable stuff. Now, and after they have, they have this encounter with these men with clothes that gleamed like lightning in verse 4, or the ESV translate that as men in dazzling clothes, and they, they run back to tell the others. I mean, of course they do. How could they keep that to themselves? So they run back, but of course the others in verse 11, they don't believe them because their words to them seem like nonsense. And if you were in their shoes, you might think the same. Those words might seem like nonsense. The stone rolled away, the empty tomb, the angelic appearance... This would have or could have sounded like nonsense. These disciples had had watched Jesus die. The the women had saw the tomb where Jesus' body was laid. Surely from their perspective, their hope was gone. Their, Their friend was gone. Their savior was gone. But no, but no. This is exactly how Jesus said it would be. He had told them outright at least three times that we read of that this is how it would be. He had to die. He would rise again. And not only had Jesus made that very clear to his first followers, but he had done so to prove that he was indeed the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy that showed that God's Messiah would suffer and die, but be raised to life again and reign eternally. And so Jesus had shown that he was the Messiah. He was the Savior, and therefore he would suffer and die and be raised again. This was not a new story. This was not some kind of plan B that had been enacted now. This was God's salvation plan and had been from the, from the beginning. But, but, but Jesus, even though he had made this so clear to his disciples, they had forgotten. Or, or perhaps as a result of their, their grief and their confusion about the week that they had just witnessed, Maybe they couldn't remember. For whatever reason, they had forgotten what he had said. And that's where this phrase from these men in dazzling clothes comes in. We see it in verses 5 to 8. It'll appear on the screen, but I encourage you to read along in your copy of God's Word if you have one there. Verses 5 to 8, we see, in, the, in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. You see, the angelic messengers encouraged the women at the tomb to remember 
Remember how he told you? And then in verse 8, they remembered his words. That's Jesus' words. They remembered that he had said that this is exactly how it would be. So we see these words in verse 7, that the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And Jesus had told them so. And so they remembered his words. And that's the encouragement that I want to bring for us this morning. I believe God would have us remember his words again. That's why these words about this risen Savior cannot be nonsense. No, Jesus said that this is how it would be. And so, of course, this is how it is. And so we're going to think about this phrase, remember his words, and especially the words that the women are reminded of in this verse from Luke 24, verse 7. Um, but, but before we look at that specific verse again, let's recognize something important about the remembering that the messengers speak of here. See, the, the messengers encourage the women to remember. It, it's, a, it's a compulsion. You know, remember what he has told you. It's not a question. It's not, do you not remember? That, that may well come across as quite an accusation. How could you have forgotten? Do you not remember? And maybe that's how we read the words. Maybe that's how even how we think of the disciples as they hear this account and think, how did they not get it? But that's not, it's not an accusation here. It's not a, how could you not remember? It's a remember, it's a bring to the fore and allow the words that you know to be true to go above the circumstances that you're facing. Remember his words. He told you this would be, take heart. Remember his words. What you're seeing is exactly how he said it would be. And on, this morning as we reflect on these words of Jesus, I want us to consider that same compulsion. Remember what he has said. Now for some of us that may feel like an accusation because the Lord may be reminding us that we have neglected to remember. But from here, Jesus told the, 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 his disciples these words, and they're encouraged to remember, to refocus themselves on what Jesus had said, not on what they're currently experiencing. You see, the words of Jesus are worth remembering. They are treasure. God has preserved these words for us in our Bibles so that we can remember them. These words of Jesus are trustworthy. They are true. They are authoritative. And as we see here, when the women remember his words, their lives are then shaped by what they remember. And so that's what I would love us to, to do this morning as we are encouraged by God to remember the words of Jesus as we see them in Scripture and then let our lives be shaped by his words because we live that out. His words are indeed solid ground to build ourselves upon. Isn't that the, the point of Jesus' parable at the end of Matthew 7 with the wise and foolish builders? The wise builder is the one who remembers and puts into practice Jesus' teaching. And he's like the man who builds his house on a rock. Jesus' words are worth remembering. And not just remembering as an intellectual exercise, but shaping, allowing him to shape our whole lives to be in conformity with his words. So remember his words and be shaped by his words. But getting back to resurrection morning, the, the women at the tomb are encouraged to remember some of these specific words about Jesus. Remember that in verse, remember that in verse uh, 7 of 24. This is what they are encouraged to remember. That while he was still with you in Galilee, he had said, the son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. This is what the women are encouraged to remember. They remember these words, and, and these words have been made clear at least three times, both in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel, which record the same account. Jesus had made it abundantly clear that this is what would happen. Let me just run through them very quickly. Luke 9, Jesus said to them, the son of man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Later on in chapter 9 of Luke, Listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. Sorry, what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand what this meant. And then later in Luke 18, 31 to 33, Jesus took the twelve aside and said to them, We're going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will, he will be delivered over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. 
And so from our vantage point on this side of history, we can look at this and think, how could they have forgotten? But like I said, let's not jump too quickly to judgment here. I know in my life, and I maybe, uh, forgive me for making assumptions, if you've been following Jesus for any length of time, there may well be words of his that you have forgotten to remember. You see, when we forget to remember his words, then we don't allow his words to shape our lives. Maybe we've just allowed distractions and, uh, and life to, to cloud our understanding of his words, and so our lives aren't shaped by them. Or maybe actually we're, we're, we're living in such busy times where we don't prioritize his words, and so we don't even hear his words in the first place to enable us to remember them. But the result of that lack of remembrance is that we, we miss out on the shaping effect of his word upon us. And so this morning, let me encourage you. Maybe there is a challenge there, a rebuke there from the Father to say, remember my words. Come and invest time in my words. But I think from this account and through all scripture, we see remember his words and allow his words to shape your whole life. And then we will follow him with all obedience and diligence and goodness, he will be glorified through us. But, but for the rest of our time this morning, let's, let's consider the, the words of Jesus, um, particularly this verse, as I keep coming back to in verse 7 of Luke 24. And what do these words, why are these words so important to remember? What do they show us? And I think they show us many things. Even in just this one verse, we're told so much truth. But I think these verses make it, this verse makes it clear about who Jesus is and why he had to come. Who Jesus is and why he had to come. See, verse 7 says, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. So what can we see here about who Jesus is and why he came? Well, the first thing that we see is that Jesus uses the title the Son of Man for himself, and that's the most common title that he gives to himself. We saw it in those other references that we looked at in Luke 9 and Luke 18. It's the most common term that he uses of himself, but what does it mean? Well, it's a reference back to... Uh, Daniel chapter 7, where Daniel in, in a vision receives this, sorry, receives a vision of a man, one like the Son of Man, we're told. And it was this figure who could carry both design, divine and human qualities. And this Son of Man that Daniel sees in his vision is given all authority and rule and will, will rule in an, an everlasting kingdom. And so this is a picture, this title should help us think about the Messiah who God would send the one who would usher in God's kingdom, the one who would reign and rule for all eternity. That is who the Son of Man is. And so for this to be the most common title Jesus uses of himself, it shows us Jesus knew who he was. He knew that he was fully God, fully man, God made flesh, dwelling among us in order to be our Messiah, the chosen one, the promised one who would take away the sins of the world. Jesus knew who he was, and this title shows us more about who he is. He is the Son of Man, fully God, fully man, here to be our Savior and our rescuer from the penalty of sin. But we also read here, if that's who he is, well then, what does that show us about why, why he came and what can we see in this verse? Well, even if we widen it out and look at other references where Jesus calls himself the Son of Man, we can see clearly that he knew what his purpose was. So in Luke 5, we see that Jesus saying the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. We see in Luke 19, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Matthew 20, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. See, the Son of Man had a particular purpose, and Jesus knew that purpose. Jesus had spoken of it many times, and we see it again here in Luke 24, verse 7. That the words are spoken to the women and that there are at least three things that the Son of Man must be. This is why Jesus came. Jesus came, the Son of Man came, and he must be delivered into the hands of sinners. He must be crucified. And on the third day, he must be raised again. Delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified and be raised again. These are things that the Son of Man must be. That is why he came. That is his purpose. He must be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and be raised again. See, it's only the Son of Man who could do these things. It was only God in human form who could die this death in order to win the victory that was won for us by him doing that. 
See, it's only Jesus who could be delivered into the hands of sinners because it was only Jesus who was sinless. He was the only one who could be that innocent sacrifice, that atoning sacrifice in our place. It was only Jesus who could be crucified because he was the only one who could bear that penalty of sin. It was only Jesus who could be raised again because it's only Jesus who can sit on the eternal throne of the kingdom of God. See, Jesus, the son of man, is the only one who can stand as the mediator between God and man. As fully human, he can pay the penalty for sin that humanity is due to pay. Even though he didn't have any sin on his own, he took the world's sin upon himself. As God incarnate, fully God, he was the only one who could bear the weight of that penalty. See, God's holy and just wrath against sin means that we, as we carry sin, and all of us do or did, all of us are, are carry sin. Not one of us is innocent in our own right. And so the penalty of that sin is the eternal judgment of God. His holiness cannot be in the presence of such sin. And so we are cast from his presence and eternally punished for it. And we can't shake that sin off ourselves. We can't work our way to goodness. We can't reclothe ourselves with righteousness. No, only Christ can do that for us. Only God has the authority as the judge of all mankind to render us guilty or free. But because we can't do anything about it ourselves, he did. He did all that was needed. He came as the sacrifice for sin. He took the penalty of sin upon himself, bearing the wrath of God upon himself, his own son. We're told in that, and we reflected on it on Good Friday, how the father turned his face away, as the hymn writer said. Jesus was crucified, and it was only Jesus who could be crucified. And as he was, he took the weight and penalty of the sin of the world. And so the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners. He must be crucified. But that is not the end of the story. He must be raised again. And not therefore showing his victory over sin and death. Showing the reality of eternal life which he welcomes us into for those of us who trust in his sacrifice in our place. Those of us who put our faith in him, recognizing that we can't remove that sin on our own. We can't have eternal life with him on our own merit. No, it is only him. And he graciously offers forgiveness to all who come in repentance and faith. And so Jesus rises from the dead, showing his victory over all powers and authorities. And he is now seated on the throne of eternity, ready to come to judge the living and the dead again. See, Christ's resurrection shows that when we come to him in repentance and faith, when we trust in his sacrifice, then he welcomes us into that eternal life which he has already ushered in, which he already is enjoying. See, based on Christ's resurrection, we can know that ours will come too. That's what we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 15. If Christ has not been raised, then neither will we, but he has been raised. And he told his disciples in John 14 that he was going to prepare a place. And so for those of us who are in Christ, then we can know with all assurance that because he has been raised, so will we in him. And so even though the, the effects of sin and our broken bodies, they still rage war against us in this world. Of course they do. But we know that this temporary world is not our eternal home. We are citizens of heaven with the risen and victorious, risen Savior Jesus. This should excite us. This should cause us to wonder and to praise. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Let's remember his words. He is the Son of Man. He is the only one who could offer forgiveness and grace. He is the only one who can stand in judgment. And he is the only one who has shown such love to outstretch his hands on the cross and therefore welcome us when we come to him and, and bow before him. To say to him, Jesus, without you, I, I have nothing to bring. I have no warrant or merit of my own. And in fact, without you, I am due to carry the penalty of sin for myself for all of eternity. And only you have offered me salvation and grace. 
What love that we see on Resurrection Sunday. We see that he is the Son of Man. He must be delivered into the hands of sinners. He must be crucified. And he must on the third day be raised again. And these things have come. These things have been so. He has been delivered. He has been crucified. He has been raised again. And so we know with all assurance that because everything he has said about that day has come to pass, everything that he has promised that is yet to be will come to pass. And so, brothers and sisters, if you are in Christ, let's remember his words. And let, let's let those words shape our lives. And if you're here this morning and you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, please remember his words. He has come to offer you forgiveness and grace. He has come to welcome you into his presence. He died on the cross and has rose again so to prove that he is the only one who can do so. The only one who can rescue and redeem. And he is patient with us so that not so that many will come in repentance. Jesus knew who he was. He knew why he came. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Let's remember his words. Not just these words from resurrection morning. Let's remember all of his words. And let's let him shape us as he calls us to live for him with that same resurrection power that is at work within each one of us. Let's pray together and then we're going to sing. Our Father, we thank you and we praise you once again for resurrection truth. We thank you for this wonderful, joyous day. Where, Of course, this is a truth and a joy that we can know every day. But we thank you for this opportunity to pause and reflect and to very intentionally remember the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We recognize who he is. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the only innocent atoning sacrifice. He is the one who went to the cross to bear the weight of sin and shame upon himself so that he could then offer us forgiveness and grace and clothe us in his righteousness and thereby welcoming us into an eternity with him. And we pray, Father, that today... That, that that truth would resonate in our hearts, it would excite our hearts, it would transform our lives. Father, that this day would not just be another Sunday, it would not just be another Easter, it would not just be another chocolate fest, but Father, that this day would be marked in eternity as, as a day when many come to faith in you and trust in you for the first time. Or for those of us who do know you, that we would have a marker in the sand. We would say, this is the day where I know with all assurance that my life is hid with Christ. And so my whole life will now be shaped by his glorious, true, authoritative words. We thank you, Father, that many of us know your saving work. And yet your work continues in our lives until you call us home. And so would you lead us on, Father? Help us to be faithful as we follow you. Help us to be bold in our sharing of you. We pray that you would be glorified. Father, that's our desire. Not that we would have a nice buzzy feeling about Resurrection Sunday, but Father, that you would be glorified through how we respond to this truth and how we live out this truth in our community. We thank you, Father. We praise you. May you be exalted and lifted high, we pray. Amen.